All right. Um, so I'm here to talk about succeeding as a startup product manager. Um, so what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to start by diving into a little bit more detail about me, um, what the role of a startup product manager looks like and where that can be a little bit different from a corporate product manager. Let's talk about how to succeed. Um, and that's going to be the bulk of the presentation is really talking about what does it look like to succeed as a startup product manager. Um, I'll give some examples as well about what success can look like as a startup product manager. And then I'm going to end with, is it for you? And to give you a few things to take away to think about, you know, is this something that would actually make sense for you in terms of your career journey? Um, to quickly cover what I'm not going to do. Um, so there's a lot of materials out there overall about skills needed for product management. I'm not going to cover all of those. I'm really going to specifically cover the qualities that are going to be most critical for success, specifically in startups. Um, I'm also going to focus specifically on early stages. So say up to about series B. Um, when I joined Borowell, it was just after the series A was raised. I was there till about a series B plus. Moves was a bit earlier stage. I joined kind of pre-seed heading towards series A. So that's kind of my experience and where I'm going to spend my time. All right, so over to about me. Um, so I am a product executive. I've spent the past number of years as a leading product within startups, specifically fintech ones, but I've got 20 years overall in terms of fintech and financial services. Um, I've done both B2B and B2C, so I have some experience in both and kind of get a sense of where those can be different. Um, so I started in larger corporations. So I, be, I always say that I've gone kind of larger to smaller through my career. Um, so starting corporations, I started at CIBC. If you're not from Canada, you may not know it, but it's one of the top five Canadian banks. Um, Finastra was an interesting company. When I joined, it was a company by a different name called DNH. It was about a thousand person Canadian company. When I left, it was a 10,000 person global company uh, and defined itself as the third largest FinTech company in the world. I got an opportunity from there to join my first startup, which was Borowell. Um, I actually had the opportunity when Borowell restructured because Borowell was structured initially more in terms of lines of business and then restructured to more of a typical org structure for startups. Um, and when that happened, I was able to take over the product function and build out that team. So at one point there, we had, sorry, John Michael, is everything okay? Yes, all good. Okay. <laughs> um, when we were head of product at Borowell, um, sorry, I was able to build out the team from scratch. Um, and we had five product managers there at one point. Um, and I worked really closely with the head of engineering to figure out how to structure those teams too, which was a really neat exercise to figure out what's the best way to structure teams to meet the strategy of the company. And there I got an opportunity to be the a chief product officer at Move. So when I joined Moves, initially it was to lead product and design. Um, and so I had a team there of product managers, about four of them and two designers. Through my journey at Moves, which was about three and a half years, um, I also took on accountabilities for engineering and data, and then I eventually took on operations and then eventually took on marketing as well. So it was really driving a lot of the really everybody kind of building and operating the product. So a really cool opportunity. Um, a quickly just about Borowell, for those who don't know Borowell, um, is probably one of the largest fintechs in Canada by the number of customers served. And Moves was an early stage startup um, providing financial services for independent contractors in the US. So I also got an opportunity to work in both markets. So leading product in Canada, Borowell, um, and really driving product in the US market for Moves. Um, maybe just like a little bit more about me. I mean, one question I get a lot is kind of what are your superpowers as a product leader? I mean, in terms of what I like, I love to solve business problems. I love to solve customer problems at a mission driven company. Um, but I think my superpower is really around building teams and building culture. And I think that's uh, startups give me a great opportunity to do that. All right, so before we talk about how to succeed as a startup PM, I just wanna do a quick definition of the role. Um, so I mean, a huge part of it is gonna be really consistent with corporate. So trying to understand the business needs and the customer needs and match them. You're also gonna do things like define what problems the product teams are gonna prioritize. You've got to spend a lot of time understanding customer needs, identifying market opportunities, and then you're going to have to deliver a product that meets those needs. Um, but some of the things that are a little bit different. So you are going to have more impact and visibility. Um, 
you are going to be critical to the success or failure of your entire company, um, which is a huge responsibility, but can be really exciting and really empowering. Um, but you've got to be ready to be really critical. Um, you also are likely to end up with a larger scope of responsibilities, and that can touch in a whole bunch of different areas. So I saw product managers that I worked with at Moves sometimes have to step into operations and help design and figure out what those processes are because it was really an extension of the customer experience. I saw another product manager dive really deep into growth for a while as we were working through iterations on go to market. Um, one thing you'll probably have to do is user research because you're not going to find a dedicated user researcher early on. Um, taking on those aspects of the product design role or something that could happen, maybe you even have to venture into design um, and if you have the background, maybe you're also venturing into development and so you've got to be ready for that kind of increased scope of responsibilities that's not going to be as. Um, you're not gonna have the same box around it as you might in a larger company. And I think the other thing that's just like really, really critical to success at a startup is really understanding your customer. If you're an early PM, that's going to be a lot of the expectation for you is to bring that into the company. So you've got to know your customer really, really well so that you're making the right bets, determining the right strategies and prioritizing the right problems to solve for them. All right, so given this role definition, I have a quick question for you to think about before we dive into what I've defined as what success looks like for a startup PM. Um, so what are some qualities that you think are critical for a startup PM to succeed? Um, and John Michael, I don't know if we were able to get it so that they could drop maybe some of those answers in the chat. Um, that's a good question. Emma, is um, are the guests able to uh, the, like, a message in the chat group? I don't think we have this enabled right now. Okay. okay. That's um, no worries. No I worries at all. No. Yeah, we'll just move forward, but I think like I think just to give everybody um, a bit of an opportunity just to think through what you think they might be. Um, and I think the other side of that, um, which is fun to think through, is what do you think some of the anti qualities would be? So what do you think are some of the qualities where folks um, may be less likely to see, succeed? Kind of that anti profile, what wouldn't serve one well? So I'll give everybody kind of 10 seconds to think about that. And then I'm going to start diving into what my answers are. Somebody put, uh, some people are answering in the Q&A section. I did open the chat if anybody wants to post there, but Stephanie, All right, awesome. Michael, you can see these Q&A answers, right? Yeah, I can uh, see I guess them. I can. Yeah. Yes, I can. I mean, curiosity, I think that makes a ton of sense. Um, taking initiative to solve problems, communication skills, I'm definitely going to cover for both internal and external. Um, and those are the folks with the best profile. So, I mean, great answers. So let me dive into what I've got. So I started with, you've got to just embrace the startup mindset. You've got to know kind of what you're getting into and be ready to, to embrace it for all of the good and the bad. So, I mean, so starting off, you've got to thrive in ambiguity. You're going to have a ton of unknowns. If you're a startup, you're doing this because no one's ever done this before. Um, so what that means is there's no right answer. Um, you know, no one's going to come along and say, oh, this is the thing you should definitely do. No one knows what the answer is. And you're just trying to find your way along the path as fast as you can um, and as quickly as you can before the company runs out of money. Um, I mean, as I kind of mentioned before, in terms of some other areas, in terms of the scope of the role, roles and responsibilities can be fluid. And really what that means is you've got to be flexible. In product, your job is going to be to make this product succeed, which is going to be part of making this company succeed. Um, and you've got to be flexible in figuring out the best ways to do that, which may not be the things that you thought you were going to be doing going in. You have to have a high risk tolerance. Um, so we're taking big swings all the time to learn as fast as we can. Most of those aren't going to work out. So you've got to be okay to take the risks and know that they might not necessarily pay off and just be really adaptable to that. Um, like take the learnings. I think the best way to figure out from an attitude perspective is to just say, hey, I'm going to take the learnings. I'm going to go from it and I'm going to place my next best bet um, and be OK with that. I think one of the other things that I've seen that's been really different is to have is you just have it's fast. So you're going to have more speed. I mean, part of that is having fewer people often leads to that um, and to have less process. I think one thing that I always found was interesting is in earlier in my career in large corporations, um, I actually worked as a process engineer for a while. So my job was to just design better processes, but I definitely found myself in startups fairly allergic to process. Um, 
you, you like sometimes you're going to need it because you're kind of hitting the same gaps over and over again and it makes sense to close them but a lot of the times it's really about just the relationships you have with your team communicating well um and you don't need to put processes in place often i think what i found is if we start to think about process it's usually to solve some sort of underlying organizational root cause which could really be a people problem and it's better to address those root causes than to start layering on process and then the other thing is being relentlessly resourceful. So Paul Graham actually has a blog article about this, which is worth checking out as he defines this as the most important quality of a startup founder. You're not gonna have the resources that you would in a larger company. So really what's gonna be important is figuring out how to be resourceful. So you don't have a research, user researcher. Um, how are you gonna get talking to customers and gain that information? You don't have access to data. How are you gonna get the best proxy to drive your decisions forward? So that's embracing the, pro the startup mindset, kind of going in to do it from there. Um, we're gonna go into a few more hard skills, I would say. Um, so if you're gonna build a product that solves an important problem for your customers and meets the needs of your business, you have to master product discovery. So I'm not gonna cover product discovery here. Um, got some great books from Teresa Torres behind me, but this is a skill that you really are gonna have to use in a startup. You're going to really need to understand your customer needs, their pain points and their behaviors. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take that qualitative data you're gaining, match it with any quantitative data you can get your hands on, and you're going to use that to drive your decision making. Um, I mean, it's obviously ideal if you can use data driven insights to guide product decisions that may not exist. I'll get into it in my examples of successful PMs later. But figuring out actually how to get that data is a pretty key skill. Um, and you want to be able to measure what's happening in your product. It's all about learning fast. So figuring out how do you gather those learnings and move forward. And the other thing I'd say is you've got to know your market. Um, I think another learning that we had at Moves is we actually discovered that a lot of our customer expectations, they were often set by how other products worked. Um, so we were able to almost figure out sometimes that the feedback we were getting from customers was because they'd used another product it worked in a different way. So as much as we thought we were kind of going from the root of our customer discovery and our customer insights, sometimes the right product decisions for just our customers understanding how things were working was to actually do it more like other companies did. And then sometimes you have to realize when you have a unique insight and it makes sense to design it differently. Um, but it is helpful. I mean, I think one thing that I like to make sure I, you don't do too, too much um, is really follow the competition and worry too much about what they're doing. You definitely wanna be driving what you're doing and your iterations on your own primary research, but you do need to understand the market and what the expectations are um, that your customers may have as a result. Another challenge I've seen a lot for startup PMs is also balancing discovery and delivery. So I thought I'd call that out here. I mean, I think it's just so critical that you're getting to know your customer, that you're putting the time into discovery to really understand their needs, prioritizing their problems. One thing where you can get into trouble is if you actually have a good sized design and engineering team who are itching to execute and deliver work, it can be really hard to balance these two things. I mean, one thing that as a leader I've thought about is how to make sure you have the right size teams to allow folks to get the right balance. Um, but you need to be putting things into market to be learning, but you also need to be going out and figuring out what's the next thing you're going to build. And I think that's uh, probably a challenge for all PMs, but I think something I've seen to be pretty acute in startups. All right, next up, you've got to define clear goals and metrics, and it's so hard. Um, but you're the person who's trying to bring some structure and clarity in as much as possible, and you're going to do this because it's going to help align teams. So some things that I've found to be helpful um, is I introduced one pagers pretty early into my journey leading product. So having a way to really define, okay, this piece of work that we're doing, really getting clear on what's the problem we're trying to solve, what's our objective, trying to figure out what kind of effort approximately we're gonna put into it. And then what is success gonna look like and what are we trying to achieve with this? And if you do that, and I think written communication is incredibly powerful for getting teams when you're working in an environment that does have a lot of ambiguity, as much clarity you can provide, the better. Um, and then you can take these really talented folks you're working with, like your designers and engineers and have them really help you solve these problems. So I think one pages are really powerful, but another thing I played around with that moves 
and found a lot of value in was uh, Amazon's PR FAQ process, especially for things that were larger customer facing releases. Uh, what you do is you're actually essentially writing the press release and then doing a whole bunch of FAQs um, to really outline the details of the piece of work that you're hoping to bring to market. And it was just so clarifying for everybody, I think across the organization, across functions in terms of really defining what it looks like in terms of value to the customer. So I found that to be a really useful exercises and I think the product managers did too. So for anything that was larger and customer facing, that's where we leaned. And then for things that were more um, internal facing or kind of smaller pieces of work, we tended to use one pagers. The other thing is that metrics are gonna have to align with both your business objectives, and then you're also gonna be able to track progress against them effectively. I'm gonna talk more about how just speed of learning is the most critical thing at a startup. So you need to make sure that you are tracking that progress. Um, but the things that you're also doing are, you know, meeting the business objectives you're trying to work towards. One thing I thought was super interesting is actually something I read last week, um, is it can be really hard to set success criteria when there's no baseline. And I'd say like we ran into this quite a bit at Moves. It's like we're bringing a new feature to market and like, you know, we hope like referrals would be an example. So we're going to imp implement a referral program. We had no idea how many we could really expect. Um, one thing I thought was an interesting take is what I read, which was maybe what your objective should be is to just say, okay, we're going to put this out there. Let's see how many referrals we get. And our learning is going to be to see that. Then you can set a baseline and determine, is that something that you want to continue to pursue? But once you've set that baseline, um, but it's really around setting that kind of criteria around what are you trying to learn? Um, and really just bring as much definition as you can in a place where that is often hard to find. All right, iterating and experimenting, I think also critical as well. Um, I think one of honestly my biggest learnings in early stage is to make sure that you understand the business risks to your strategy. Because again, your role is gonna be a lot about really understanding your customers, but also can you build a business? Um, and what are the biggest risks to that? And make sure you're addressing those first. I think sometimes it can be tempting to prioritize pieces of work that are you kind of know are gonna work, like you've heard the customer feedback, you know these are things that are important, but doing them may not actually help you learn a lot about if like the overall business is gonna work and if some of your key risks can be addressed. Um, you may see some good positive metrics and that might feel really good. Um, but I think it's, you've got to be careful not to fall just into the things that you have kind of high conviction on, but that you're addressing the most important things. I highlighted here because speed of learning is everything. Um, you know, you only, it's really about how much time you have to learn and learning as fast as you can. Um, so you've got to pursue that urgently. A part of that is execution. I saw something on, I'm going to call it Twitter because I'm not, I'm not changing what I call it yet. Um, but I saw something yesterday saying uh, with Mark Zuckerberg talking about execution. I mean, the thing is with executing quickly is you actually get to, I'm going to use a sports analogy here, but you get some shots on goal. Um, the more you can execute, the faster you can execute, the more tests, the more iterations that you can do. Because um, you've got to figure this all out before you run out of money. So it's important to start with the kind of the most important things you need to learn and then learn as fast as you can. You've got to choose your experiments really wisely um, because you only have so many resources and you only have so much time. But you also need to make sure that you're not going so fast that you don't forget to plan for feedback loops. You've got to make sure that you gather the learnings. Um, you know, you're going to fail fast, hopefully. If you're going to fail, you're going to learn quickly and you're going to iterate based on the insights. I think one of the common challenges we saw at Moves was also figuring out, hey, if something didn't work as well as we had hoped, um, because I think you're always gonna go in optimistically and feel pretty excited about the things you try to prioritize, but when they don't work, how do you decide if further iteration is needed? I think going back to the last slide, one, understanding what your success criteria was and then holding yourself accountable to it instead of kind of rationalizing why it maybe didn't perform as you had hoped. Um, but I think that probably the biggest thing I learned is to really think about what hypotheses you have about why it didn't work and then kind of go through those and say, okay, like, what are some things that I could do what I think, you know, might, might improve our performance, but then like really 
test yourself to say, are these things that are really going to move the needle or are they just going to make it a little bit better, but overall kind of our performance wasn't sufficient and we've got to just move on to another bet. Um, and I think that can be really hard to do because you do get really excited about your ideas. Um, but if you don't have a hypothesis about something that is going to change it significantly, um, it's time to move on to the next bet. All right, communication and collaboration was one of the answers we saw in the Q&A. Um, but you're the person that everybody's coming to for clarity. Um, obviously, like there could be co-founders there as well and more senior folks, um, but the team that's looking for direction on a more day-to-day -day basis is coming to you. So I mean, the nice thing about startups is that communication should be easier, but it's also more critical. Um, one thing that I've seen is there is no substitute for strong relationships. So you've got to spend your time to build them and build them across the entire organization. One thing I've seen is it's also just really important if there is an issue or a gap is to really go direct to the person that you may have that misunderstanding with. It can be tempting sometimes to kind of go up the organization to try to influence because sometimes it's not easy to have these critical conversations. I think it's okay to do that. You might get some perspective that you didn't have, some more context in terms that'll help you guide that conversation. So get some advice, um, but then to take that back and really work across the organization to build those relationships. It's the only way you're gonna get the speed that you need and to avoid the process I spoke about earlier. Um, I went to a webinar once and they said that in product, really any organizational problem is your problem. So it makes for a really fun job, um, which we've we've all tried to sign up for. Um, but if it's blocking your objectives and the objectives of your customer, or the objectives of your company, you've got to deal with it. And so that can look really interesting. Um, but those strong relationships are going to be really important as you go to do that. You've got to foster trust and collaboration everywhere. So I mean, definitely with your engineering and design partners, um, you know, marketing and go to market is going to be really critical as well. And any other team, again, operations or sales, um, sometimes these boundaries aren't going to be clear. And so what you need to do sometimes if there is friction kind of at the boundaries of these roles is to have some really explicit conversations to negotiate them. But a lot of it is going to be working together and figuring out just basically who's in the best position to do what you need to do as an organization. So that's, I mean, I think, again, from John's answer in the Q&A, that's a little bit of the internal communication, but external is super important as well. Um, whether that with your customers, so you've got to cultivate relationships with them and that's how you're going to get the feedback and the insights you need to figure out your next bet and where you're going to prioritize uh, the limited resources you have. So overcoming challenges. Um, ch it can be tough because you're the optimist rallying teams towards the work that you want to do. You're championing the vision, you're getting people excited, but challenges are going to come up. Um, failure is going to come up. So you have to be optimistic, but you also have to be able to handle and pivot when things don't work. Um, so I think resilience and perseverance in the face of obstacles is super important. Um, but here are some of the common frustrations I think I've seen that I thought I would be worth sharing. So I've seen PMs get frustrated sometimes when they don't get enough direction. So they're sitting there, maybe their last bet isn't working. They're trying to understand, okay, what do I, what should I do next? Like, what is the next best bet? What is like for what we're trying to achieve from where we are as a business? What do I need to be doing in terms of prioritizing problems? Any thoughts? Maybe I'll just let you think about it for a second as to why that might be. So why would a product manager feel like they actually don't know? I think you, you kind of sometimes hear about product managers who have like, they're hearing so many ideas and so many things that it's really just a prioritization game. I think always in early stage, because there's just so much room in front of you, there's actually a lot of things that you could be working on. So it's not that there's not enough, but it's trying to figure out what are the ones that are actually going to really make a difference. Um, so why do you think they might be struggling for direction? So here's my little secret when that happens. It's generally because no one has the answers and they're hoping that you're going to be the one that can help bring them. Um, so that's, I think, you know, that's been tough. And I think what I've seen is you can end up with kind of two different founder scenarios that might lead you here. So one is the founder that's hoping that you've got the answers. 
Um, one of the most qu frustrating questions I saw a product manager get is, okay, so you're saying you wanna do this initiative, what other options did you consider? And so as a product manager, you know, you've probably gone out, you've done a ton of discovery, you've gone through cycles, maybe you've prototyped, you've iterated, you've gotten huge conviction that it's gonna move what you've been tasked to move from a priority. And then you get this question of like, well, what other things did you look at? Um, and so, I mean, that's tough because that's kind of almost looking for product as a prioritization framework, but that's, that's not what the job is, right? It is to try to figure out and validate so you get conviction and ready to move something into delivery. But the other way that you can end up with some friction with founders is almost like, so that was kind of describing the lack of direction scenario is to have too much direction. Um, so you might end up with somebody who's being really prescriptive. It's gonna depend when you get hired into an organization, um, but founders who have really championed and own the product direction and are kind of giving that up, they might come in telling you exactly what they think it should be. I think what can be really challenging here is that they could be wrong. Um, and so that, I think, you know, that one we could probably dive into pretty far. Um, I mean, I think a couple of things that just come to mind there is one, you know, make sure that you're really understanding and hearing, because sometimes if you disagree, it could be just that you're not communicating well. Um, but then I think you're also going to be in a position where you're going to have to prove out why there might be a different approach or a different opinion. Um, but you know, they are going to end up with, I think, a lot of the things I've described so far, maybe being less critical if you end up becoming more of a project manager for a fail, a project manager for a founder. Um, but I'm going to imagine most of the folks on this call, that's not the role they're hoping to have. And even if they find themselves in it, they're going to be looking for ways to try to influence, um, to be able to bring more of the product thinking into the organization. Um, so I spoke about handling failure a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, I think maybe just I'll drop an example here in terms of kind of the resilience and perseverance that you need in the face of obstacles. So for moves, we were in the US market, we had a partner bank that needed to approve most things that we needed to do in the product that were significant. Um, so some of the struggles and like, I think anybody who's in a compliance heavy environment may run into this as well is you we would end up sometimes having a feature that we think was really really important and then we weren't able to get approval as fast at least as we wanted um for that feature or parts of how we wanted to design the feature um were more controversial than others i think what we found was really critical there was just knowing our customers really well and then you can kind of know in terms of the feedback you're getting where you can compromise and where you can't until you come to um an agreement of something that that can work um, and it's really, you know, I've talked a bit about that deep knowledge of the customer, and I think that's really critical. And then I think the other thing in terms of challenges is just being able to adapt to know new information. Um, you've, you're going to be getting market feedback, customer feedback, things are moving all around you. You've got to be open to change and then have to pivot when necessary um, and continuously reassess strategies and tactics based on the market feedback you're getting. Um, it's going to be a pretty critical part of being, and it's hard because you're always trying to plan that path out um, and do as much planning as you can and give as much certainty as you can, but that new information is always coming in and then so you've always got to be looking at um, where do you adapt and where do you make changes. All right, so just some examples. I think I've covered a few so far, um, but what does success look like? So I think overall, it's really about business impact. Um, so I kind of covered that first. So, I mean, your success is really the business's success, but let's get a little bit more tactical. Um, I've mentioned how having data is really useful. Um, I have an example of a product manager who really wasn't able to get the data to measure what we needed to know to figure out, okay, where do we go from here? Um, this product manager had used Amplitude in the past and so advocated for getting a tool set up. But instead of just trying to kind of go and find somebody to approve a cost or to get it set up or like get a data somebody hired in data. Um, they advocated for it and then they set it up themselves, they got a approval to set up a free trial started using it. Um, getting engineering support on the tel telemetry to support it um, and then started showing value and like these are the types of I mean resourcefulness is probably a good word here. Um, the kind of things that you need to do to prove that to just do what you need to do to make yourself and the organization successful. Um, 
I mean, one of the other things I think I've seen be really important for product managers succeeding in startups is just confidence. You need to have you know, you are setting a lot of the direction for a lot of folks in the organization. So projecting that confidence, but also having that optimism to lead the team and get behind you as you navigate all of the uncertainty and ambiguity is really important. Um, and another one that kind of just stood out to me, I was just thinking about some of the very successful product managers I've worked with um, is humility, but the humility comes from like, you've got that confidence, you can kind of sit on that confidence and be humble enough to ask questions and be able to ask questions to anybody at any level in the organization. So if you're struggling to figure out what is that next piece of work um, and you've kind of got maybe a couple of things that look a little bit differently and you're trying to figure out kind of between them, um, I think the best product managers just ask a lot of questions and like they just come um, with all of the things they're struggling with and I think as I would have conversations with product managers um, on some of these decision points and having these like tactical decision points were really helpful. We'd actually work together to clarify which one do we think we should go with, but what did that mean? What was the kind of strategy that that choice implied? And what did that mean in terms of priorities? And then that would actually help us make better decisions in the next, uh, the next scenario. So some of the, so kind of to sum that up. So qualities of that resourcefulness, that confidence and the humility are some of the things I've seen be like really standout qualities for the great PMs I've worked with. All right, so that comes to now the question around, should you join a startup? So I think what I would start with is as I was going through this conversation, how did you feel? So did you feel scared or nervous as I talked about what's needed and what some of the challenges were? Or did you find it really exciting and really motivating to say, hey, I know I've got these qualities and I could do this? Um, I mean, just be honest with yourself. Could you thrive in that type of environment? Do you have the confidence in your abilities? Can you be resourceful and can you challenge? I do think sometimes it's hard to have that confidence at the beginning of a career. Um, but I mean, I haven't, we, at Moves, we ended up hiring a intern to come into product and we thought, okay, like that's great, but she really blew us away. We actually had to come in for another internship. And when she was about to graduate, we didn't have a product role open to her, but she actually had a lot of experience with design as well. So we actually brought her on as a product designer. Um, and she just dove in to learn everything she could about that. And then we eventually had a product role open and she stepped into it and stepped into some pretty big shoes and killed it. So, I mean, I do think, I mean, I've seen people success doing this early in their career. Um, and I, I'm super impressed by anybody that can do that because I do think um, there is sometimes some confidence that comes with experience um, that's helpful to bring in. So, I mean, another thing to think about is, are you able to take on the risk? Um, so I think like startups have a reputation for not being very stable. We know a lot of them fail. Um, but I think in this environment, the market is so tough. I mean, it's been brutal in 2024 in terms of the layoffs that we're seeing in the tech market. So there's not that much stability in big companies these days early either. Um, so that kind of brings me to my last point, which is like, what are you optimizing for? So I think if you're trying to optimize for learning, having a huge impact in your role, um, going into a mission driven company, looking at culture and who you're working with, I think startups can be a great choice. If you're looking for a bit more stability, um, if you wanna work on mastery of your craft where you get an opportunity to work with a lot more folks in product, because the one thing with a startup is you're not gonna have a lot of other pro product folks around. Um, and even though your role is gonna have an outsized impact in a startup, the scale of your impact can be a lot larger in a corporation, um, just because you probably are serving an awful lot more users. So, I mean, I think those are some things to consider. I know for me, I loved working with incredible talent on problems that matter. Uh, I think in general, when I'm looking at a new role, especially in product, I like to think about what are the problems I'm going in to solve. And I think when people hire for these roles, they generally have something they're looking to have somebody come in and solve. And trying to figure out what that is, is that to have somebody come in and manage a lot of sales folks who are coming and making a bunch of different promises to customers and how do you prioritize that? That can sometimes be a role that people are looking for in terms of a problem to come fill. Um, 
But I think for me, the roles I get excited about are ones where it's really about building a company and building a business. Um, and so I would say I would challenge you to think about what are the problems that you want to solve. Um, and maybe just one last watch out is also just think about for these roles, do you really think the organization needs a PM? Because it's interesting when you start bringing in some of these early product hires, especially in a world where you've got a founder who's really owned the product and the vision. Um, what is the problem they're looking for you to solve? And does that make sense for the org and make sense for what you're looking to do? So that would be my last thing to think about. And then I think we're over to the Q&A. John, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I, I, th I thought that was a really insightful presentation. And I think what I think really resonates is this your authenticity in terms of how difficult, I mean, the actual, it's the challenges of being a product manager at a startup is actually really real. And it's really kind of tests whether, you know, when you put your feet in the fire, like near the fire, is this the right for you? Um, so, you know, I, I see a couple of questions posted here. So for those of you who are on the call, please feel free to um, post your questions in the Q&A section and we'll go over them. Um, so Stephanie, I want to ask you a question that came from the audience. Do you have any advice for a trigger moment to look out for when you think something or someone might be wrong in a product scenario? So I think there's a couple things maybe that I spoke about that where this comes to mind. So to figure out which one it might fit in. I mean, if it's um, like I think I spoke about founders potentially having um, might be wrong. Um, I think for a product person, if that's the case where you think like you're getting direction that you maybe are questioning. What I found to be super helpful is to just think about. I don't know, I have a tendency to have a gut reaction as to why I think something might not be a bad idea, but try to figure out, okay, like what are the assumptions and the hypotheses you are making that underpin that? So I really like to think of, I think there's always unsaid assumptions. And I think kind of, if you can go through that mental thought process of figuring out what your assumptions are, it gives you a chance to challenge them, but then you also might be able to go and have the conversation with that other person to say, hey, here's my assumption. Do you agree with it or not agree with it? And then instead of kind of having that conversation at the solution level, which I think always ends up not getting too, too far where you end up maybe just like two camps and two positions. Um, if you can get to a place where you're talking about the different assumptions and then kind of figuring and challenging those. Um, and then if you can bring in data points that you have, which are maybe why you're reacting to that, maybe them being wrong, um, whether that's conversations you've had with customers that are leading you to a different conclusion or data you're seeing and sharing that can be really powerful to shape it as well. So I think those would be my suggestions in terms of an approach. Yeah, and I like to add to that stuff because I completely agree in terms of, you know, what you said. I think uh, when we look at product, it's, you know, the why. What is the problem that we're trying to solve for the customer? And, you know, despite, you know, all of our experiences, um, you know, whether it's, you know, regardless of what industry you're in, a lot of times, for example, it's very easy to make assumptions that if something worked in a certain space, it's going to work here. And the thing is, is that not all customers are the same. And it's very important to validate that. That's why this, the whole idea of test and iterate is so, so important because there's nothing worse than making a bunch of assumptions, over-solutioning over, over something where it's just not making, moving the dial or, you know, increasing the value to the customer. And um, it's it's something where it's, I think we, sometimes it's very easy to be solutions forward sometimes. It's like, you know, I've got it. This is a silver bullet. Um, I figured it out. And a lot of times it's, uh, to your point that you mentioned earlier, you have to be able to look at failure differently. It's about learning. It's not about, um, you know, uh, you, 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 you experiment and then it, it, it doesn't work as you expected. That's a learning. And to take a sports analogy, because I know you use the sports analogy, <laughs> baseball, they say, is that if you're a great baseball hitter, you're batting 300. And 300 means that three out of 10 times, whether it's a bunt, single, double, uh, triple home run, I mean, you're, you, that means 70% of the time you don't get a hit. And I, I think that... Um, companies and product organizations are adopting that mentality, but 
it's very easy to be very self-critical as an organization or critical of yourself as a product manager to say, I, you know, I, I thought this would work and, you know, it didn't work out. And then you kind of look at yourself in the mirror. And it's important to look at those as learnings because if you don't, if you're not learning, then you're not progressing. So I um, wanted to add to that point as well, too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think it is super important to also be in an environment that allows you to do that learning. And that can be hard too, is to train people to accept that. I think I've been really fortunate um, to work with founders who understand that not everything's going to work. And as long as we move fast and take our learnings from it, and he said, don't, don't take too much time to get those learnings. Cause I mean, sometimes if you think someone might be wrong and you can learn it fast, you can try it and see anyway, and then go from there. Um, Cause maybe you're not right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question, would you recommend a startup for a first product manager job? Yeah, I, had, I talked about this a little bit with the intern that I mentioned. I think generally I wouldn't. Um, maybe a couple of quick stories on this. I mean, one, I think for sure when I was hiring, I often did look for folks that had um, especially for more senior PM roles, folks that had some experience they could bring to the table. I think you've got to make sure if you're going to bring in more junior folks, you've got a really strong support system to help them there. Um, I also know somebody in the product space who I haven't worked with directly, who her first PM job was at a company. Um, she had made like, I mean, like, like people commonly do, I think from like a customer success to a product transition but didn't know product um, and ended up spending a lot of time going out to the community to learn about it. Um, but I think in the end realized she wasn't even doing product. She didn't know what product was. The expectations were not really product. Um, and that first experience didn't serve her very well. She went to another organization where there were other product folks and really learned it and has been really successful since, but I think really struggled with, again, not having product experience to go in and be a solo PM. Um, but then my like, Counter example to that is the product manager that we hired who kind of started as an intern with us. Um, and, and she was just, you know, learned a ton, had an amazing attitude, was really able to gain the confidence of a team, um, be really thoughtful, but also like somehow, despite being very junior in her career, had the confidence um, to bring that humility I spoke about. So, I mean, I think you could, it, it's possible. Um, she wasn't the only PM and so had a really good support network there too. So I think that's something that I would definitely look for is making sure that you've got that support and the folks you can learn on um, if you were considering it. But I think I'll, I'll also be a realistic. It's really hard to break into product management. Um, so if that's something you really want to do and you got an opportunity to be the first PM at a startup, um, it's, it's a great thing to get started with and to get on that path and start gaining that experience. So I definitely wouldn't uh, tell anyone if they got that opportunity to turn it down. No, well said. I think that uh, product now, it's, I think there was a time when um, people didn't know what product managers did. Now it's um, something where um, the, it, it is, it's a really desirable role. Um, lots of people, um, whether they're in technology, they're doing project management, they do product marketing. They really want to get into product management. Here in Toronto, there's, um, quite a few um, trade um, schools where they focus strictly on on uh, product management. This is post post secondary. So I, I think that because now there's more demand for it, I, I think the view on how you enter uh, product is has changed. And I think to your point, one those these opportunities to enter product are you know rare. So when you have that opportunity, you really have to kind of take advantage of that. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. Like the person I spoke to who had kind of a tough time in that role, um, there weren't the same support resources out there. And I think you can always find external ways to support your journey as well, as long as you're, you're hungry to learn. Yes. Oh, this is a really interesting question. So um, uh, just to jump around a little bit, have either one of us taken a failure and adapted it to a successful product outcome? Could you share what that surprising outcome was? Anything quickly come to mind for you? Um, I, 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 yes. So I, I can definitely provide a recent example. So, um, so in my recent role, 
Um, we made the hypothesis. So in my role, I drive site search and product recommendations across of all Canadians, Canadian Tire banners. And the hypothesis was is that in order to make the recommendations and search results more relevant for customers, it was a matter of just changing the algorithm. Um, so um, that intuitively makes a lot of sense is, um, you know, based on how the customer is behaving, um, you just make changes to the business rules and magically the recommendations will get better or the search experiences will get better. So we made these tweaks. And again, these were low effort, you know, potentially high impact to the customer. And we actually didn't, there was no impact at all, believe it or not. And as we understood why this was happening, we realized that a lot of it boils down to data. Um, there's the, this, this, this analogy that when you have good data going into a system, you're going to get really good results. But when the data is bad, meaning there could be an influx of product attributes, which would be um, skewing this, the, the algorithm and, and confusing it, where it's leveraging irrelevant data to pull the right recommendations or search results, um, that effectively is the root cause. And this was like the big aha moment. But then we realized that how the data was coming to the digital space was layers and layers of complexity due to legacy systems and how the data was being managed. So without giving out too information, that was something that we learned. And it was something where um, it was a lot of low effort to validate these hypotheses, but then it made us realize that um, the, the causes were a lot deeper than we, we expected. And it made us really focus and prioritize with technology and the merchandising team, how we could essentially um, provide a separate data source uh, so that that way it would be independent of what was happening across the connected um, ecosystem at Canadian Tire. Cool. Yeah. So that's my example. Nice. Um, Stephanie, you want to provide one? Yeah. Um, I think what comes to mind is just a moves example for me. So one part of the product uh, was to be able to give cash advances to gig workers. So we served Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, Instacart, DoorDash. These are folks that if their car breaks down, they can't earn money. Um, so we were able to provide a product where we could advance them the money to get that car repairs so they could get back to work, and then they could make repayments as they started to earn again. When we first started offering that product, our loss rates were terrible. Um, and so I think what we did know is there was a lot of demand for it. So like product market fit was looking good, but for product market fit for, um, where there's a credit risk, you need to make sure you're managing that credit risk or it doesn't really count as product market fit. Um, so we went through, we went through some iterations, made some changes to the product. And then we realized just get based on the performance, we weren't just going to quickly iterate our way. We had probably like a more. A, a safer way that we could have kind of a gradually improved things over while like keeping the product more consistent so it wouldn't be such a shock to the folks that were our current customers. But in the end, we said, hey, this is a big gap we need to close. So we think we're probably going to end up in this new paradigm where we've made like fairly significant changes to um, the criteria to access these advances. And so we just made a big swing and we made like a massive change to how we structured the product overnight. And we were really worried that we would get a lot of backlash and lose customers over it. Um, but in the end, we were able to get the credit performance significantly improved and still be able to meet the customer need. Um, definitely there was a little bit of friction, but we didn't actually lose, you know, we heard, we heard it from more of a customer perspective, but we didn't um, see it in terms of a cover retention hit. So we were able to kind of maintain the business performance um, while greatly improving credit risk um, to the point that we were able to make that product work really, really well. So then we could actually give it that product market fit check mark. Amazing. That's, that's, no, that's, that's really great that that was the outcome that you achieved. Um, here's another question for you, Stephanie. Um, so I, and this, I, when I see this question, it kind of makes me smile a little bit because when we 
first met, I think we really bonded in the sense that we've taken very similar journeys working for big corporations and then, you know, kind of moving to the shadow space. Um, so the question is, uh, when should a product manager working at a corporate, you know, bigger corporation consider making the move to a startup? Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I think part of it is from some of these skills that I've outlined kind of over the past while, do they feel they have those skills? Do they feel they've got enough tools in their tool belt um, to be able to jump into that role with confidence? And are they ready to operate with less support? Um, and so kind of some of the things I talked about on that, that last slide in terms of how to think about whether a startup's for you is like, I mean, the short answer here is partly when do you want to? Like, when is it aligned with what you want as a career goal? Um, I do think it's a great way to accelerate learnings. Um, so I mean, I think if learning is a priority, um, if you want to, uh, to challenge yourself and to challenge kind of your product management abilities and maybe operate in a different environment, I think it can be an amazing choice. Um, but you've got to feel kind of ready to dive into it and want to dive into it. No, absolutely. I, as, as you were sharing that stuff, I was taken back to um, some of my startup experiences. And I, I think um, to your point, there, there, definitely less support, less structure, but I think it's uh, being able to, to operate autonomously and to be able to make decisions quickly. And um, I, I think what I appreciate at startups for, for better or worse is that the safeguards aren't there in place. I, I think when you're working for a more established business, uh, a lot of times decisions that you make or don't make, um, you know, like again, it's just like the business can really like absorb it and, and things go, the lights stay on. In a startup, you really feel it. And that's pretty, that's like, that's when you feel alive in a lot of ways. So. Um, I, I think that's really good perspective in terms of how a product manager evaluates that. Um, here's here's an here's an interesting question. Have you ever faced second syndrome second system syndrome? What happened when you ran into opposition to deprecating the original system and accelerating the second scalable system? Mm. I don't know if I've ever actually heard second system syndrome as a, as a term before, but I think I, I get the gist of the question based on what, uh, what else is in there. Um, I mean, I've definitely run into this at a large company where we were like, hey, we've got this old outdated tech, let's rip it out and replace it with something more modern. Those are such tough uh, situations. I think it took years, like this was like multi-year project and it took years and years and years with a lot of customer pushback to do. Um, but I've got some successful examples in a startup environment of doing it. So moves, I talked a bit about the cash advance product. Um, when we were in Canada, that product was structured differently. So we actually started the product in Canada looking to get product market fit. And because of the way um, it's actually a lot easier to get started with a lending product in Canada based on the provincial red, red, uh, legislation. So we were able to start offering that as a personal term loan product. We had to structure the product completely differently. Um, we moved to the US market and yes, we completely restructured the lending product. So from was more of a personal term loan to a cash advance product. Um, and so the system that we used for loan originations when we were in Canada eventually became way less relevant in the US market for our product. Our product was actually dramatically simplified. Um, and we had a product that we had bought that actually was just way more complicated than what we needed. Um, but I think, again, being kind of an early stage startup, I was able to get engineering with a huge amount of conviction that the right thing to do would be. Um, to actually rip out that old system. I think based on my experiences at larger companies before, I think that terrified me, um, but I definitely trusted the engineers on the team and they were able to actually build the replacement system that was a fully in-house build. So got us off a of vendor um, that actually enabled a lot more iteration and experimentation and flexibility on the product. And I think we, were able to get the entire thing stood up and implemented and then started switching over within two months, um, which was a really like tremendous outcome um, that really enabled a ton. Yeah, and I'll just kind of add to that because I, I think um, second, second system syndrome um, or effect, 
I mean, I have had a little experience with it. And I, I think this kind of goes back to um, the trifecta. Um, you know, product is the what, the problem, you know, why we do this, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Design is, uh, you know, the customer interaction problem. And then there's, oh, there's technology, which is how we solve that problem. And when I've faced this scenario, it is when um, engineering over solutions problem, or they might bring in a partner that has solved this problem, but there's all these bells and whistles and says, we can do this, this, and this. And, um, you know, despite having an RFP, uh, despite being really clear on what we're looking at measuring, um, so it's just, it, sometimes things can get really conflated. So I, I think one of the key things to, to be really, it's really important is it's always important to have product and technology having that alignment. Um, one of the things that work, has worked really effectively um, recently in my career is um, having, you know, there's onus on product to define the roadmap and saying, you know, this is the vision, this is how we're leveraging data insights to say this is the features that we're going to deliver for customers. But I also believe that technology should have a roadmap as well, too, because they're updating legacy systems. They're doing they're going to be swapping out different uh, movings to the cloud, for example. And it's more about understanding, you know, the why. So as product leaders, I think we need to ask internally, why are we doing this? Why is this happening? And I think this goes to, you know, where do we invest our resources? And I, I think to Stephanie's point, in a startup where resources is extremely more, if not more limited than, than a corporate environment, that's where you have healthy conversations saying, you know, why are we getting, you know, like spending X dollars on this type of software with these, all these features? It just, it's like, it, it, I think those are the conversations where a product manager can help lead, but not necessarily pointing the finger. It's again, what is the problem we're trying to solve? How are we measuring success? Again, going back to OKRs, what is, how does this align with business objectives? And from there, that you can have a healthy conversation with all internal stakeholders. Um, so I just realized that we're, we've got a one minute left. So um, I, I maybe see we have one, one minute for one quick question, Stephanie, and then I'll, I'll, I'll close it off. Um, for managers of product, man, for managers of product managers, how do you suggest intervening when you see your reports rearing too far away from discovery and too often to delivery and execution? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think when I said like in a startup, I said team members have to jump into any problem that face the business. Um, I mean, I think there's times when it's like really, really early stage, really um, small teams, you've got to dive in there. Um, but what I've actually seen probably more examples of is those pieces are outside of the teams of design and engineering. So when it's like jumping into other problems in the business, it's often been with other teams. So not necessarily the folks delivering. Um, I definitely coach product managers to try to stick with defining the problem and really leaving it to the experts in design and engineering to figure out the solutions. Um, so I, mean, I do think you know getting involved with those other functions can also take you away from discovery, um, but delivery I really do try to to keep the product managers out of um, trying to stay away from project management and getting too deep. Um, but I think what I've probably some of my key to success on that front has been hiring amazing designers who really can take those problems and come up with amazing solutions. Um, I think finding those great designers has been a challenge I've had for quite a while. Um, but I have, I have found a few of them um, and it's amazing what a difference they can make. And then having just amazing engineering partners who really understand what you're trying to do and can help figure out the right solutions in partnership with product and design. Amen to that. Um, so I'd like to close things off. So first of all, on behalf of the product that counts community, I'd like to thank Stephanie for sharing her valuable insights on being a successful impactful product manager in the startup space. For those of you who are on the call, please be on the lookout in your inbox as we will be sharing this recording, as well as making it available in the Product That Counts portal. So you can watch it again or share it with your product colleagues. Um, so, you know, again, thank you again, Stephanie, for um, your time. And I, I love today's conversation. It just uh, makes me want to try to start off soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thanks so much we'll, for having me. It was great. We'll, yeah. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. All right. Good night. Bye.